Another thing that many people have brought up to us that came up yesterday was something called the Samson option. Considering the conflict with what's going on with Israel, I think it's particularly relevant to this story. For those who aren't familiar, the Samson option is the name that some military analysts and authors have given to Israel's deterrent strategy of massive retaliation with nuclear weapons as a last resort against a country whose military has invaded and or destroyed much of Israel. Commentators also have employed the term to, to refer to situations where non-nuclear, non-Israeli actors have threatened conventional weapons retaliation, such as Yasser Arafat. Now, what's interesting about that concept of the Samson option, the general idea being, if this, so we, we have this convoy of Hamas storming in, killing civilians, Israel then starts target, targeting Hamas uh, 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 bases and weapons depots and things like this, civilians get caught in the crossfire, they die. We then get fake videos. There was a fake video today, apparently, of Qatar saying that they were going to cut off gas supply. Not real. It's been debunked, uh, my understanding. But you have threats from Iran. You have Lindsey Graham saying war with Iran. If there is an invasion of Israel, the fear is that they're just going to say we, we, we refuse to be destroyed and they'll fire a nuke at their enemy. But I think the reality is any country with a nuclear weapon that is invaded and is facing extinction or, or non-existence is going to launch a nuclear weapon. So the fear here is... Israel being particularly vulnerable, if they launch a nuke, then what happens? I mean, it's going to be all out World War Three, massive nuclear warfare. Yeah. I mean, when I think about it, the Samson option was essentially the core of what in the Cold War we called mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm. Because mutually assured destruction is the United States has 10,000 nuclear warheads and the Soviet Union has 10,000 nuclear warheads. And the reason you have peace is each side makes a public declaration that if the other side launches nukes, you will do the same and cause essentially the extinction of mankind. And it's that mutual fear, oddly enough, that keeps both parties reasonably well behaved. Now we're in a post-Cold War era, of course, but I don't see why that logic disappears. It remains actually identical, except now it has to be applied you know, more regionally or more locally. But why would a country allow its own extinction without wanting to visit exactly the same on the people who perpetrated that? I mean, this is a case where, I mean, I suppose there's a certain, at a certain theoretical level, you could have, well, listen, they've already launched these nukes. I'm going to die anyway. Why should I kill more people? I just need to sit tight and let myself be blown up. But that's not realistic. No one really right. thinks like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I've never been through a nuclear war, but I, it's not just oh, yeah. like the nuke hits and then that's the end. Like a nuke will set up the stage for an invasion. Like you can level the ground, level ever, all the defensive capabilities and then invade the, the, the city that got nuked. Like two days later or something or a day well, later. Well, also there's fallout for, <clears throat> there's all sorts of things that happen afterwards that also suck. If you don't die immediately, it's almost worse. Radiation yeah. and yeah, all 48 kinds of hours of fallout or something. Did the Chinese, are they actually uh, genetically altering their soldiers to be radiation resistant? We talked about that. There a was a report ago. that they're, they've started breeding genetic super soldiers. I mean, that's a scary reality yeah. of what's to come. And so I, I suppose the concern is not even nuclear weapons. I think that's old school thinking. It is, it, it, honestly, it is actually crazy to me that most people to this day are like nuclear weapons. I'm like, bro, that's a hundred years old, basically. Like they started developing this stuff a hundred years ago. Yeah. Deployed a couple, by today's standards, weak ones. That's kind of scary to think too. Yeah. And then really, I mean, what, since the seventies, we've had ICBMs and, and MIRVs and things like mm -hmm. this. The US 10 years ago uh, uh, funded the, the, uh, a very, very small megaton gravity bomb basically pocket-sized version of the fat man. And uh, we also have these ICBMs of hypersonics. But I think people need to understand that a lot of the research has been in targeted biological weapons. And the real scary thought is not that Israel says, we're going to fire a nuke, but that they're like, we're going to unleash a virus or something like that. Or like an insect plague. I think that people have been using insects also. I mean, well, think, yeah. think, let's, let's think about this in, in realistically. You've got ethnic conflict in the Middle East. Right. These are groups that hate each other based on their ethnic heritage. Wouldn't they be specifically trying to target if, if, if you've got groups of people saying that they want to eradicate right. is Israel, would they not make weapons specifically to do so? If they had the capabilities, they probably would. I, I, I do believe that it's more about territory and less about genetics at, at the core. I think it's about who owns that area of the world 